Before going into the video, keep in mind that this video is meant for revision. If you have already read the NCERT of each chapter, or watched them on YouTube, then you can revise from this video. But if you are learning a chapter for the first time, you should not watch this video. First, watch the animation videos. The link of the playlist is there in the description. If you are learning all chapters for the first time, you should first watch the playlist. Don't worry. The videos are short, interesting, and cover NCERT line by line. After that, you can watch this video, which will take about 50 minutes of your focused mind. Are you ready? It was the time of the Franco-Prussian War. Two French districts, Alsace and Lorraine passed into Prussian hands. The narrator, Franz was late for school. His teacher M. Hamill would question them on participles, but he hadn't learned it. At the town hall, there was a crowd in front of the bulletin board. The blacksmith who had read the news told Franz not to hurry. When he entered the school it was strangely quiet. When he entered the class M. Hamill didn't scold him. He saw that M. Hamill had on his green coat, his frilled shirt and a black silk cap. He wore these clothes only on special occasion. On the back benches the village people sat. Old Hauser, the former mayor the postmaster. M. Hamill said that the order had come to teach only German in schools of Alsace and Lorraine. This was the last lesson he was giving. Franz was startled with this news. He hardly knew to read and write in his own language. He felt sorry for not learning the lessons. M. Hamill called his name to recite the rule of the participle. He tried to say it, but got confused. M. Hamill didn't scold him. He told that all of them were to be blamed. He praised their mother tongue. After teaching all the lessons, M. Hamill wrote on the blackboard, Vive la France, that is, long live France. Anise Jang tells Sahib, a rag picker, half joking, that she'll build a school. He takes it seriously, it embarrassed her. Sahib roams the street with army of barefoot boys. First doesn't wear chapels because he don't want to. Second boy wears unmatched shoes. Third wants shoes as he has never wore one. The writer wonders if, boys are barefoot as it is a tradition, is the only excuse of perpetual poverty. She remembers a story a man from Adipi told her. As a young boy, he'd stop at a temple to pray for shoes on the way to school. When Annas visited the temple 30 years later, the new priest's son was wearing school dress, socks and shoes. The other boy's prayer was also fulfilled. This proves even priest's sons are wearing shoes, so staying barefoot isn't tradition for ragbicker. Ragbickers live in Simapuri, a place on the periphery, edge, of Delhi. There are mud houses, roofs of tarpaulin, no sewage or running water. For 30 years more than 10,000 ragpickers live here. They've no identity or permits. They've rationed cards that let them vote and buy grain. Children grow up in poverty and become partners in survival, and survival there means rag picking. Through the years rag picking has acquired the status of fine art. They've become trained. For children, garbage is wrapped in wonder, for elders it's a means of survival. One morning, Saheb stood behind a fence gate watching two men playing tennis. He too was wearing tennis shoes someone gave them to him. They're discarded by some rich boy, perhaps because there is a hole in one, but for Sahib, it's a dream come true. 
Now Sahib works at a tea stall and gets 800 rupees a month and all his meals. But he has lost his carefree look. The canister is heavier than his rag picking bag, which was his own. Now he is not his own master. Mukesh's dream looms like a mirage in the dust of streets of Ferozabad. Ferozabad is the center of glass blowing industry. No one in the families know that if law is enforced, it could get the 20,000 children out of the furnaces, often losing their eyesight. Mukesh volunteers the writer to his home. On one side is a vessel of spinach leaves and stove. On ground are more chopped vegetables. The frail young woman is cooking meal. She is in charge of her husband, Mukesh, and their father. Mukesh's grandmother had watched her husband go blind. Families sit in dark hutments welding the pieces. Their eyes are adjusted to dark, so they lose eyesight. Savita sits along an elderly woman. Her hands move like tongs of machine. She has never enjoyed a full meal in her lifetime. Her husband has a roof over his head, which many haven't. The young men echo the meds of their elders. Young men avoid organizing, as they'll be sent to jail by police. They talk of spirals, moving to poverty, to apathy, to greed, to injustice. The writer sees two worlds. 1. Family, caught in poverty, burdened by stigma of caste. 2. Viscous circle of Saharkar, middlemen bureaucrats, politicians. They together have imposed baggage on the child. But Mukesh wants something else. He dreams of cars, but not airplanes. The narrator, William Douglas, decided to learn to swim at the age of 10 or 11. There was a pool at the YMCA in Yakima River. The pool was 2 to 3 feet steep at one end, but 9 feet at the other. At the age of 4, he stood in the surf with his father in the beach in California, but waves knocked him down. He was frightened. He sat on the side of the YMCA pool to wait for others. A teen came and tossed him into the deep end. He was frightened, but was conscious. He planned to make a big jump, come to the surface, lie flat, and paddle to the edge. Those nine feet were more like ninety. When his feet hit bottom, he made a jump, but came up slowly. His eyes and nose came out, then he started going down again. He lost his breath, his lungs ached, head throbbed. But he knew the plan, jump from the bottom, lie flat and paddle to the edge of the pool. On the way down, stark terror seized him. Only his heart and the throbbing head said he was alive. When he jumped it made no difference. He trembled, his arms and legs wouldn't move. Then he started going down again. Now he was relaxed. No terror. He saw his death coming. Too tired to jump. Next, he saw himself beside the pool vomiting. He couldn't eat that night. Some years later, his terror ruined all his fishing trips, deprived him of the joy of canoeing, boating and swimming. One October, he decided to get an instructor and learn to swim. He practiced five days a week, an hour each day. A rope attached to his belt went through a pulley. The instructor would relax his hold on the rope. The narrator went under, a bit of the old terror returned. He taught him to put head under, exhale, and raise nose, inhale. Next, he taught to kick the legs. 
Finally, Douglas became a good swimmer. But he was still not satisfied. He went to Lake Wentworth in New Hampshire. Dived at Triggs Island. Swam to Stampback Island. He camped in Conrad Meadows, dived into the lake, and swam. He had conquered his fear of water. The experience had a deep meaning for him. He had experienced both sensation of dying and terror that fear of death can produce. A man sold rat traps and did small thefts to survive. Once a thought came to him that the whole world was a big rat trap. It had existed just to set baits for people. One evening, he knocked at the door of a little cottage. There lived an old man alone. He welcomed him. He told about his cow which supported him. They played Jolas. He showed the rat trap seller a leather pouch, hanging in the window frame, which had 30 kroners. Next day, both went out. The old man locked the door, but half hour later, the rat trap seller broke the window pane and stole the money. He turned into the forest. After some time, he found no way out. He was trapped inside the forest. He realized that he was fooled by the bait and was caught. Late in December, just as he was about to die, he heard a sound, hammer strokes from an iron mill. He got up and followed the sound. It was Ramsio Ironworks. The master smith and his helper sat in the forge. Anyone would come there for warmth in front of the fire. The rat trap peddler asked the smith for shelter, and he agreed. The ironworks was owned by an iron master, who would come to the forge for inspection. Due to a trap seller's beard and hat, and the darkness, the iron master mistook him for his old comrade. When he invited the peddler to his home, he disagreed. He sent his daughter Edla to persuade him come home. She thought the man was frightened. She said in such a friendly manner, that the peddler agreed to come to their home. The peddler knew that the Iron Master will know he was not his comrade. He was again trapped. Next day was Christmas Eve. The servant bathed and shaved the peddler, and cut his hair. The Iron Master understood that he had made a mistake in the darkness. He thundered at the poor man. The peddler told him about the world being a big rat trap, and that he himself will also get caught in the bait one day. He told the peddler to get out. Edler requests him to let him stay there for one day. In the evening, the tree was lit. He ate the fish and porridge. Next morning, the Iron Master and Edla went to the Christmas service. The peddler was asleep. At church, they came to know that an old crafter of the iron works was robbed by a man selling rat traps. The Iron Master knew who he was. When they returned, their guest had already gone. But he left a package, in which was a rat trap, the thirty kroners, and a letter. In the letter, he thanked Edla for being kind, as if he was a real captain. He requested to return the money to the crofter, and Rat Trap was a gift from Rat, who was now raised to a captain. At the 1916 INC convention, a peasant, Raj Kumar Shukla, requested Gandhi to come to his village Champaran, to see injustice of landlord system. After going to Calcutta, both took a train to Putna to see Rajendra Prasad, but found he was not there. Rajendra's servants took Gandhi as an untouchable, and did not allow him to draw water from the well. 
Gandhi decided to go to Muzaffarpur. He stayed in the home of Professor Malakani. Lawyers discuss with Gandhi. He scolded the lawyers for collecting big fees. Estates in Champaran were owned by Englishmen, worked by Indians, who had to grow 15% of their land holdings with indigo, and give the entire indigo harvest as rent. Gandhi arrived in Champaran. He went to Secretary of British Landlords Association. The secretary didn't tell him anything. Then he went to Commissioner of Tirhut Division, where he was told him to leave Tirhut. And to Motahari. He continued his investigations in the house. From Motahari, he went to a nearby village. A police messenger told him to quit Champaran, but Gandhi didn't. So he was summoned to the court the next day. Thousands of peasants demonstrated. Gandhi helped the officials regulate the crowd. Lawyers told if Gandhi was jailed, they'd return. But then they agreed to follow him into jail. Gandhi remarked it as victory. The case was dropped. In June, Gandhi was summoned to lieutenant governor. They got the evidence against the planters and asked for refunds. Gandhi agreed a 25% refund. He told that the fact that the landlord surrendered was more important than the amount. Gandhi saw the social backwardness of Champaran, called people from his ashram. They got the doctor and taught cleanliness rules. Earlier, C.F. Andrews, a follower of Gandhi, wished to help him before going to the Fiji Island. But Gandhi opposed. He told the lawyers that seeking help from an Englishman showed the weakness of their heart. Pancake was the name of makeup material bought in Gemini Studios. The makeup department was in the upstairs of a building said to have been Robert Clive's stables. The makeup room looked like a hair cutting salon with lights at all angles. It was a fiery misery for those subjected to mock up. The department was first headed by a Bengali, then by Maharashtra, who was assisted by a Darwar, Andhra, Christian and Tamil. This shows that there was national integration long before All India Radio and Dor Darshan. The makeup men would make an actor look ugly like a monster using pancake potions and lotions. The hierarchy was maintained in the department. Chief would do mock up of the main hero heroine. Senior assistant, second hero heroine. Junior assistant, comedian, and so forth. The makeup department had an office boy who, in fact, was in his forties. His work was to do mock up of crowd players. The author worked in a cubicle. His work was to collect newspaper cuttings all day. Others thought he did a work meant for barbers. Anyone would come to him and give a lecture. Similarly the office boy came and read out his poems. The author prayed for crowd shooting to get rid of him. The office boy thought that all his woes, ignominy and neglect were due to Kathaminga Lam Sabu. Subbu was number two at Gemini Studios. He had to face difficult times to begin his career. He was less educated than the office boy. He had the ability to look cheerful at all times. His loyalty attracted his principal the boss. He was tailor-made for films. Once the producer wanted to do the scene of a rat killing a tiger, but showing love to her cubs. Sabu came out with four ways of showing this scene. When he wasn't satisfied, Sabu came out with fourteen more ways. He was a poet too. He composed story poems and wrote a novel, Ilana Mahanambal. He also played subsidiary roles in films. 
His house was a permanent residence for dozens of near and far acquaintances. Yet he had enemies, perhaps because he was so close with the boss. He was grouped under the story department, which comprised the legal advisor, writers and poets. Once a talented but moody actress burst out on the sets. The lawyer quietly switched on the recording equipment. When she stopped, he played it back. Hearing her own voices, he was shocked. She couldn't recover from the terror, and her career ended. The legal advisor, lawyer, was a man of cold logic in a crowd of dreamers. As he was close to the boss, he was allowed to produce a film. Though a lot of pancake was used, his film turned out flop. The boss closed down the story department, and he lost his job. The studios was the favorite place for poets like S.D.S. Yagar, Sang Subramaniam, Krishna Sastri, and Harendranath Chattopadhyay. A cup of coffee was a satisfying entertainment. Everyone except office boy and some clerks radiated leisure. Most wore Katie and worshipped Gandhi. They were against the idea of communism. Frank Bunchman's moral rearmament army. Mra chose the studios as host. Mra was a counter movement to international communism. They presented the plays, Jotham Valley, and The Forgotten Factor, and impressed the Tamil drama community. Months later, telephones of big bosses of matters buzzed, as a visitor was coming to the studio. Some guessed he was an editor. The boss, Mr. Vassan, introduced him, but didn't know much about him. When the visitor spoke, he told about his thrills and travails as a poet. Due to his British accent, the audience couldn't understand the word. His visit was a mystery. The Hindu had published that a short story contest was being organized by a periodical, The Encounter. To know about the periodical, he sneaked into the British Council Library. There were copies of the periodical line. The editor's name was Stephen Spender. He was the editor who had visited Gemini Studios. The author felt a bell ringing in his heart. Years later he found books on a footpath, for 50 pays each. He bought one copy of book, The God That Failed. In this, six writers described their journeys to communism, and their disillusioned return. One of those was Stephen Spender. Thus, the purpose of his visit to the studios was revealed. The interview has become a commonplace for journalism, since its invention about 130 years ago. Opinions of the interview, its functions and merits, vary considerably. Some claim it, in highest form, source of truth, in practice, and art. Celebrities see them as its victims, and consider it, an unwarranted intrusion into their lives. versus Nepal feels that some people are wounded by interviews. Lewis Carroll had a just horror of the interviewer, and never agreed to be interviewed. Rudyard Kipling thinks interview is immoral. It's like a crime and merits punishment. But few years before, he himself interviewed Mark Twain. H.G. Wells referred the interviewing ordeal, but he interviewed Joseph Stalin. Saul Bellow once described interviews as thumbprints on a windpipe. Dennis Bryan says, our most vivid impressions are through interviews. The interviewer holds a position of power and influence.
It is an extract from an interview of Umberto Eco. A professor is scholar for ideas on semiotics, literary interpretation, and medieval aesthetics. Then he turned to writing fictions. He acquired intellectual superstardom with the publication of The Name of the Rose, which sold 10 to 15 million copies. He says, the universe mostly comprises of empty spaces. Similarly, he works in the interstices, that is, waste of time. He does narrative writing. He gave his dissertation as a story of the research. His professor appreciated and published it. At 22, he understood that scholarly books should be written by telling the story of the research. He started writing novels at about 50. His friend Roland Barks, an essayist, always wanted to do creative writing, but died before. The Name of the Rose is a detective novel, delving into metaphysics, theology and medieval history. He was not puzzled at the success of his novel, but journalists and publishers were. He says if the novel was written ten years earlier or later, it wouldn't get that success. Why it succeeded at that time is a mystery. Sophie was a daydreamer. She dreamed of opening a boutique, becoming a fashion designer, or an actress. Her friend, Jancy, was practical. She knew that they were poor, and were earmarked to work at Biscuit Factory. She told Sophie to be sensible. Sophie's father teases her as she says she'll get money. Little Derek says she thinks money grows on trees. Her mother gave a sigh. The room was steamy from the stove. Sophie went to look for brother Jeff. Jeff spoke a little. He was grown up and traveled to work every day. He was a mechanic. The places he went fascinated Sophie as they were unknown to her. She wished Jeff would take her there. He was tinkering with a motorcycle part. Sophie told him she met Danny Casey, a footballer. Even knowing it was her dream, Jeff listened. He told Dad she met Casey. He considers Sophie's story as one of her wild stories. He was a big fan of Casey in football. Sophie asks Jeff to promise to keep the incident a secret. Jeff warns her that Casey might have strings of girls. She told him she met Casey in the arcade and asked for autograph, but neither had pen or paper. Casey invites her to meet next week. On Saturday, they made their pilgrimage to watch football match. Casey made the second goal and United 1-0. Jeff had told the secret to Frank, from whom it reached Jancy. Jancy wanted to know more about it. Sophie told her to keep it a secret. She cursed Jeff for breaking the promise. Jancy was too bad at keeping a secret. But she realized that Jancy only knew that she met Danny Casey, and not that he invited her to meet again. In dark, she walked by the canal, to a place she thought was perfect for meeting Casey. She thought he'd come. But she began doubting after some time. She was sad that if Casey didn't come, her family will never believe her story. She walked out disappointed, reimagining the dream of Casey meeting him. All dreams and disappointments were in her mind. She had met Casey in person only once, in the football match. This story explores adolescent fantasizing and hero worship. Everyone knew that the Grand Central Station had two levels, but the writer, 
Charlie, had visited the third level. He told his experience to his psychiatrist friend. He considers it a dream. He collected stamps, a temporary refugee from reality. One night he went to the Grand Central to take the subway to go home. He got lost. He always did. Once he came out at lobby of Roosevelt Hotel, and once in an office building. He found a long tunnel. He kept walking. He came out at the third level. The rooms were smaller and old looking. There were gas lights. Man in the booth wore long sleeve protectors. There was a courier and knives locomotive. He glanced at a newspaper, The World. The date was June 11, 1894. At the ticket window, he found he could go with his wife, Louisa, to Galesburg, Illinois, of 1894. Galesburg was a beautiful town in 1894. Summer evenings were longer, life was peaceful. When he counted the money, the clerk stared at him. The money there was old style bills. The clerk ran after him. He turned out. The next day, he drew $300 out of the bank and bought old style currency. He wanted to go to Galesburg of 1894, but he couldn't find the third level again. His friend Sam Wiener disappeared. He had always liked to go Galesburg. One night fussing with his stamp collection, he found a new stamp issued. Someone had mailed it to his grandfather. The date was July 18, 1894. In this, Sam told Charlie that he has reached Galesburg with his wife. He invites him. Charlie found that Sam had bought $800 worth of old-style bill for hay business. Sam was his psychiatrist. The Maharaja of Pratibandipuram is known as the Tiger King. When he was born, the astrologers foretold that one day he would have to die. The ten-day-old king said that everyone has to die one day. Then the chief astrologer said that his death will come from a tiger. When he came of age at twenty, the state came to his hands. He killed a tiger. Then he asked the astrologer if he was safe now. The astrologer said that he should be careful with the hundredth tiger. He swore that if the last tiger is also killed, he'll tear his astrology books, set fire to them, cut his hair, and become an insurance agent. The Maharaja banned tiger hunting by anyone except himself. He decided to attend all other matters only after killing hundred tigers. Once a high-ranking British officer visited Pratobandapuram. He wanted to kill a tiger, but the Maharaja disagreed. The Maharaja and the Diwan decided that they'll send 50 diamond rings to the British officer's wife. But she took all the rings. Though the king lost 3 lakh rupees, his kingdom was retained. He killed 70 tigers in 10 years. He ordered the Diwan to find a girl he could marry in a royal estate having large tiger population. He married a girl. Now only one tiger remained to be killed out of hundred. In this state, sheep began to disappear from a village, means, a tiger was present. But the tiger wasn't found. Many officers lost jobs. The Maharaja doubled tax in the village. At night, the Diwan took a tiger to the forest, which was brought from People's Park in Madras. The next day, the Maharaja shot the tiger. It fell. When he went, 
the hunters found that the tiger was alive. Afraid of losing jobs, they killed it. Some days later, the Maharaja's son's third birthday was celebrated. He decided to gift him something special. He found a wooden tiger in a toy shop and decided it was the perfect gift. One sliver from the wooden tiger pierced Maharaja's hand. Next day, infection flared into his arm. Three surgeons decided to operate. The Maharaja was dead. In this way, the hundredth tiger took his final revenge. Tishani Toshi boarded a Russian research ship, Academic Shokalsky, heading towards Antarctica. The journey began 13.09 degrees north of equator in Madras, involved nine time zones, six checkpoints three water bodies and ecospheres. She had been traveling over 100 hours, so she felt relief on reaching, and also wondered about its immensity. 650 million years ago, a supercontinent, Gondwana, existed, centered at now Antarctica. That time humans didn't exist, and climate was warmer. To visit Antarctica, is to understand the significance of Cordilleran folds, and Precambrian granite shields, ozone and carbon, evolution and extinction. It gets mind-boggling to think, India jamming against Asia to form Himalayas, South America drifting to join North America, keeping Antarctica desolate. For her, two weeks in a place where 90% of the total ice is stored, is a chilling prospect, both for metabolic functions, and imagination. Days go on and on in 24-hour austral summer light, and silence is present everywhere. Human civilization has been found just 12,000 years old. We've dominated over nature with villages, cities, megacities. Climate change is one of the most hotly contested debates. Population rise has resulted in global warming. Antarctica is a crucial element in this debate, as it has never sustained a human population. It holds half-million-year-old carbon records in its ice cores. Students on ice takes high school students to Antarctica, provide them a life-changing experience. It's impossible to go near the South Pole and remain unaffected. When you see ice shelves collapsing, you realize the threat is real. Antarctica, because of simple ecosystem and no biodiversity, is best place to study how little changes in environment can have big reactions. Phytoplankton, a single-celled plant in the sea, performs photosynthesis. These grasses sustain the South Ocean's food chain. Scientists warn that depletion in ozone layer will affect its activity, which will affect the global carbon cycle. At 65.55 degrees south, the ship wedged into a stretch of ice. The captain decided all the 52 persons will walk on the ocean. Below them was a meter thick ice pack, and below it, 180 meters of seawater, crab eater seals were stretching, just like stray dogs. Tishani wondered what will happen if Antarctica becomes warm again. Dr. Sadao Hoka's house was on the Japanese coast, where he had often played. His father felt infinite pains upon his only son. He was a true patriot, nationalist. He sent Sadao to America to learn about surgery at 22. He became a famous surgeon and scientist. As the old general of Japan might need an operation at any time, he remained in Japan. He met Hannah in America at a professor's house. They later married in Japan. One night they were standing at the veranda when a man came out of the sea and fell. He was injured very seriously. 
they found he was an American prisoner. Due to a rock, a gun wound at right of his lower back had been reopened. As a surgeon, he had the duty to save his life. But as a patriot, he couldn't save his enemy. He packed the bleeding wound with sea moss. Finally, they both decided to keep him in the house, and cure him, and then send him to the police. They lifted him to an empty room. Hannah didn't want Sadao to clean him. She told Yummy, their maidservant. Yummy disagreed to wash the white man. The old gardener said that his master should not cure their enemy, lest the gun and the sea will take revenge on him. She herself washed the man's upper body, but couldn't dare to turn him over. Sadao had decided to operate. Anxious of the fine floor covering, she went out to bring strips of matting, but when she returned, the blood had already spilled. Sadao tells her to give the white man the anesthetic if he needs it. The bullet was still there. Hannah fainted. She had never seen an operation before she went out to vomit. Finally, the bullet was out. Then he thrust a hypodermic into the patient's left arm. On third day after operation, Sadao saw him sitting up. He asks Sadao if they'll hand him to the police. Yummy told Hana that they couldn't stay with him if they hide a white man. One morning, the servants talked. The gardener said that Sadao knew what he should do, the cook said that Sadao was proud of his skill to save life. Yummy said they should think about the children. The white man told Hana his name, Tom. On the seventh day, two things happened. The servants left. A messenger in a social uniform came. Both thought that the servants had told the police about the secret. But actually he had come to call him, as the general was in pain. When he went to the general, he told him that they were hiding a prisoner. The general said that he'll send his assassins to kill the man, and take his body at night. When Sadao came to see Tom, he was out of bed. He scolds him. He waited three days for the assassins to come and kill Tom, but he was in the bed every day. Sadao thinks to put his boat on shore with clothing so that the prisoner go to an island and live there until a Korean boat pass. The evening he dragged the boat, put food, water, and two quilts in it. The prisoner was now dressed in Japanese clothes. He had a flashlight. He left. Sadao tells the general that the man had escaped. The general said that he forgot to send the assassins. He asks Sadao to keep this a secret. That night, there was no prick of flashlight, means the man was gone with a Korean boat. Standing on the veranda, he thought about all the white faces he had met. Derry is a 14-year-old boy. One side of his face is burnt. He entered Mr. Lamb's garden through the wall. Mr. Lamb is an old man with one leg of tin. Derry tells him that everybody is afraid of him. Mr. Lamb says that he wasn't trying to avoid his face. He says that he has weeds in his garden. He calls them the weed garden. He shows his tin leg to Derry. It blew off in the war, but children come to his garden. He says that it's not what you look like, it's what you are inside. 
Derry says that one woman said, that he should live only with the people with burnt faces. But Lamb doesn't agree. Derry asks how he has learned all this. Lamb says that he does it by waiting, watching, and listening. Derry hates people. Lamb tells that it hurts more than a burned face. Lamb tells him a story. A man locked up in a room afraid of everything. A picture fell off the wall and killed him. Derry likes to be there. He promises Lamb that he would come back. When he comes home, his mother doesn't let him go there, but he runs out. On reaching, he finds that Lamb has fallen the letter and died. He cried. It was the writer's first day at the school. Carlisle Indian School. It was cold day. The bell rang for breakfast. All the girls were placed to march to the dining room. Her blanket had been taken off from her shoulder. The other girls didn't care that they were dressed immodestly. They wore stiff shoes and tight dresses. A small bell rang, and everyone drew a chair. She sat on her chair but found that no one did. When the second bell rang, all were seated. The third bell was tapped. Everyone began eating. A pale-faced woman stared at her. She started crying. Later, her friend Judawin told her that she heard the woman talk about cutting their hair. Their mothers had taught that only unskilled warriors, who were captured, had their hair shingled by the enemy. She went into a room upstairs and hid under a bed. Everyone searched and finally found her. She resisted by kicking, shaking her head, but finally her hair was cut. She cried, but no one came to comfort her. When Bama studied in the third class, she hadn't heard people speak on untouchability, but had experienced it. One day she was going home from school. The distance was ten minutes, yet it would take her half an hour. Because she saw performing monkey, snake, cyclist, the Mariata temple, the fish stall, the sweet stall, etc. At times political parties would put up a stage. There were coffee clubs. She saw a threshing floor had been set up. The landlord sat and watched. She stood there to watch. An elder of the street was coming from the bazaar. He held a small packet by the string, not touching it. She wondered. The elder went to the landlord, bowed and gave him the packet. The landlord opened it and ate the vidas. She went home and told this story to Annan, elder brother. He told her that people believed, if he touched the packet, it would be polluted. She didn't laugh anymore. She wondered why an elder had to bring the Vardais for the landlord, and bow low. Annan was studying at a university. He had come home for holidays. Landlord's man asked his address. The point was to know his caste. He told Barma that if they study and progress, they can throw away these indignities. 